Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to another episode of Entrepreneur Mind Speak. I'm Lauren, owner of Creme de Mint, a branding and packaging design agency that specializes in beauty, food, and supplement product businesses. And this week, my co host Natalie is on vacation. So today, I am bringing on um, Christine Klon. She is founder and CEO of Kemi Queen Bee, a product development and small batch manufacturing company here in San Diego, California. And I am so excited to have you on this podcast so that we can talk about formulation, custom formulation. Definitely. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for that intro, Lauren. Let's first start with like, how did you get started in your career in custom formulation? I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I guess I'll start. If you want to go way back, right? My childhood growing up in Dallas. Um, first of all, I saw a lot of pink Cadillacs driving around, you know, beauty, you know, for certain companies where a lot of women were doing really well for themselves and there were beauty products. So I always found that interesting. Mary Kay you know, is in Dallas. Absolutely. Um, and so yeah. that's, so those are the things I grew up with is it was okay to be like a country girl, but still be girly. And, uh, and when I was seven, um, I actually got some Barbie. It's really funny that the Barbie movie just came out, but I got some Barbie shrinky dinks for my birthday, uh, for my best friend, Jenny. And <clears throat> we decided, you know, we made them at my, my mom's, my parents' house, uh, and they were safe. You know, we cut them out and colored them and they're just this sheet of plastic. And, and if you remember them, uh, but we had fun playing with them and we'd melt them in the oven and there were instructions and everything went really well. And so I decided on my own, of course, the ripe age of seven, that it would be fun to see if other plastics would melt in the oven as well. And so I oh knew my that, gosh. I could, yeah, it wasn't good. I knew I'd get in trouble with my mom. So we did it at Jenny's house. <laughs> And actually, uh, I talked to her sister not too long ago, and we were laughing. She said, oh, I remember that smell, and I remember the black oh. smoke coming out of the oven. It was my first chemistry experiment gone wrong. Uh, but, you know, that was kind of the fun of it is growing up and just having that mind of, like, how does this work? What, you know, I want to figure this out. And, and I grew up with a lot of mathematicians and scientists uh, and engineers around me, so it was a kind of an easy career to go into. Um, and then I went into chemical engineering, which was kind of a catch-all. And the reason I chose chemical engineering was because I love chemistry, but I like applied chemistry. You know, I think chemistry is great and a test too, but what can I do with it to make, make the world a better place, you know, to apply it to something? Uh, and that's where the engineering comes in, uh, is to take an idea, make it, and then be able to make it on scale where you can actually, you know, help larger numbers of people. Um, and I got my master's in chemical engineering, which I swore I would never do in undergrad. Uh, but I focused on biochemical and understanding how, uh, well, how stem cells work and how the body even takes different nutrients and it gets into the, the blood and it gets into the brain and how these things like one cofactor triggers another. And, um, and, and I was fascinated by that. You know, it was like chemistry, but pertaining to the human body. Uh, and so that's really what I focused on in my master's degree. And I've worked in different industries, biotech, pharma. Um, but I think for me, you know, as much as wearing a, a scary, you know, a, a bunny suit in a clean room is fun. Uh, for me, I enjoy the more hands-on practical products like beauty products, you know, that we use daily, uh, but to make them where they actually work using the science behind it to make things that actually do what they say they're going to do and do it safely. So that's really what, why I love doing what I do now. I work with a lot of um, small businesses that are looking to start their own custom beauty product lines. So one of the questions I'm curious about is like, what is important to you when you're looking for suppliers for the raw materials? And I'd love to hear you discuss the importance of um, polymers in cosmetic development and surfactants. Okay, awesome. So for me, choosing vendors, it, I try to choose the purest, most natural, highest quality ingredients. And the reason is because as an engineer, you know, we've learned that garbage in equals garbage out. So if I can start with the best ingredients, you know, I don't buy my, my lavender online. I buy it from a, a world renowned supplier who can tell me, who walks into those Bulgarian lavender fields and can tell me what the lavender crop is going to look like next year. They can give me a C of A from a GC mass spec machine that says, these are the percentages of every single component in this lavender from this exact batch. 
uh, a lot of your suppliers of these ingredients are actually repackagers. And I actually discovered this when I was working at a company and we were putting a lot of stuff on our GC mass spec. And to get two lavenders that match perfectly, have, basically it's a fingerprint of the percentages. I knew immediately that the second one that I put on was repackaging the first one's material. You'd be surprised at the number. There's like one or a couple of pure suppliers out there and a lot of repackagers. And we see that as well with supplements and we see it with these different, you know, whether it's vitamins uh, that I'm buying to add to something. I don't care as much about it, you know, where it's coming from necessarily. A lot of things are coming from China. We know that. I care more that if lavender is best from Bulgaria, that I'm getting Bulgarian lavender. If, uh, you know, clove is best from India or somewhere else, that I'm getting that specific clove because of the components in that clove. So these plants can vary dramatically by where they're grown. And, uh, and the price varies significantly uh, depending on that. And of course, then if you say, I, I'm only going to use organic ingredients, that means they have to be certified. So in order to, you know, do that, you're paying more a lot of times for that certification. Uh, so, so certainly being able to meet clients' needs, if it has to be vegan or it has to be halal or kosher or these different things. So that's how I choose a lot of my suppliers is I've met people along the way. Uh, I get referred by even my clients will sometimes say, hey, I found this great supplier that I'm, I'm loving. Can we work with them? And, uh, and then I find a whole new supplier that has some great ingredients. Uh, you know, I just recently found a, a new one that I'm, I'm, I'm in love with. I've been R&Ding their stuff and, and my clients are pretty excited. So, so it's just a matter of meeting the right people. But my thing is staying on that really clean, pure, natural end. And making sure, you know, based on they're giving me certificates of analysis with every single batch and, and even samples, they'll send the free samples to me that have those C of A's and I read them and I look at them and, and I look at those active ingredients, you know, obviously for turmeric, it's curcumin. That's the active ingredient that you're going for in the mixture that is turmeric. And so I'm looking for the highest curcumin levels, you know, from those certificates of analysis. So that's where having that science and engineering background really helps because you can wade through all of the, uh, the, the, the liars or the people that aren't maybe 100% true because the data doesn't lie. So that's how I choose a lot of my vendors is by their attention to detail and their purity uh, and their knowledge base. You know, the people that I work with have an incredible knowledge base in their industry. That's great. And um, I noticed that you said that you're, you're willing to source from wherever that product is um, the best. Um, does that, do you source from China as well then? Yeah. So it depends. I usually will source with, you know, USA uh, companies, but then sometimes they have to source from China for some, depending on the ingredient. Uh, but again, they have a lot of things from a lot of places in the world. So they usually give you options where you can either have, you know, Chinese, um, you know, a Chinese chamomile versus an Indian chamomile or something like that. And so it also depends on, again, what that C of A says, you know, is really the reason that people used to care, cared most about the sourcing of where it was grown is to get those best nutrients out. But maybe, you know, China had a better year and India didn't have a good year. And so actually that <clears throat> Chinese, you know, component that being grown there actually was better than the Indian component for the components I'm looking for, for the active ingredients. Uh, but it really depends, you know, obviously there's politics and there's, you know, economy involved in that, but, but a lot of it is choosing great reputable companies in the world that have places all over so that you have a lot of options of where to source things from and you're getting them from where they grow best. I have an approved vendor approved supplier list and that's part of being CGMP, you know, being compliant with the FDA is having an approved supplier list and, and going through an actual you know, checklist that I've developed internally that says, do, you know, does this person meet my requirements to be one of my approved suppliers or my approved manufacturers? And so I go through that process in my own company where, you know, I look over their CFAs, I look and see what people have said about them. I mean, it's important, you know, reviews, while they aren't necessarily scientific, you can certainly glean things from, you know, especially larger companies and really reading some of, you know, reading some of the fine print uh, and then just, you know, my representative, you know, are they educated in their area? You know, are they just a salesperson or is this somebody who has like a botany background, you know, so, and they can really tell me about the Bulgarian lavender crops. So, so a lot of it is just taking the time to do your due diligence. Uh, and, but also, you know, that's what I, I'm here for as well, you know, as a person to get you started, 
I have my, my list. And so my goal is to share that. Once someone signs on with me as their client, I'm like, here's my favorite beauty manufacturer that's not far up the road. Here's my favorite source of terpenes. Here's my favorite source of essential oils and supplements. And here's some great people. And uh, let me let me put you in touch with my suppliers and my manufacturers. So I do that for my clients so that they already have a, a network to start with. And certainly they can go off on their own, but they don't feel so lost. You know, they have a place to start. Once you've developed a formula, um, do you do some sort of like cosmetic testing or like, and how long does it take for a formula to get tested? So typically with beauty, as long as it's a, a cosmetic and not a drug, there are no required tests by, by for the FDA. Uh, now in house, I always do pH tests. I do a quick pH test because I need to know that everything I'm doing is pH balanced. Uh, we certainly don't want to you know, burn anybody. Uh, you know, and have any issues on their skin. So I check and make sure my pH is where it should be. And I also check my viscosity as well. So, you know, how is the, you know, when you make a lotion correctly, uh, then it should be the same, you know, thickness, right? It shouldn't be thinner one time and thicker another and all that that creates all sorts of problems in manufacturing and packaging, right? Uh, so those are things I check internally. And, uh, and then I always take the last bottle home, you know, that's mine to slather on and just literally physically test what I just made on myself. Uh, I have fairly sensitive skin. So it's uh, also a good quick test of, you know, making sure everything is, is feels the same and all that. Um, and as far as external testing, the FDA really only requires that for anything that would be considered a drug. So uh, sunscreen, because it's highly regulated, mosquito repellent, you have to have some evidence base that it works, it, like it said, you're saying it does, or if you make a medical claim. Um, and so there have to be clinical trials if it's more of a, this helps with pain, since pain, pain isn't really a measurable thing, right? So you'd have to do more of a clinical trial with people. And of course, you're, that gets into a lot of money. Um, but then different ones, uh, there's certainly other testing that you can do. Uh, if you were claiming, hey, there's X amount of dimethicone in this, then if that's on your packaging, then you have to send it to a beauty lab and they can actually run it through uh, their testing, which could be either GC mass spec, um, HPLC, I'm not gonna go into all the analytics, but, uh, but there's different analytical uh, tests that can be done. And that way it comes back to you and it says, you know, here's, here's your viscosity, here's your pH, here's the amount of active ingredient. And that's really when it matters is if you're claiming an active ingredient is doing something besides the basic hydrating, making you pretty, you know, the, the very generic beauty uh, stuff. If you're going into, hey, this'll do this for you, then that's where you really have to have some kind of, boom, we're claiming 5% active lidocaine. So I better come, I better go and get that tested and come back and show those 5% lidocaine. But again, that's more of a drug than a cosmetic. Um, the only other thing is if you're using dyes, uh, we found that you do have to register the products. Every product does not have to be registered with the FDA. Obviously, uh, big manufacturers register their products, but that's one reason why they prefer to do white label is because they have all those bases registered. Here's my base for a, a, day, a day cream, right? And that's all registered with the FDA. So now if I make one little tweak or whatever, I've already got that recipe in with the FDA and they know what I'm doing. So, so certainly those can be registered, but generally you don't have to register your products. You do if you add some of the ingredients like dyes because they are regulated and there is a limit to how much you can put in. So you, again, that's where you would have to file your recipe with them and then ha have them show them some data saying, I've only put this amount of red dye 40 in my product and, uh, and proving to them that you haven't gone over the limit for red dye 40. So the way we get around it, the way I get around it is I use natural products. So I'm gonna use micas because micas are not regulated at all. There is no harm to micas as long as you use finely ground cosmetic mica. And, uh, and it's something that I know isn't going to break anybody out in a rash. So, so I tend to go around these regulations by staying as clean and pure as possible. And then I know that I'm not going to have any issues. So. And if you're taking your formulation to be tested, is there a certain amount of time that something like that takes? Um, typically most labs can do a turnaround of about, you know, a week to two weeks. It, it just depends on the lab and how backed up they are. Uh, but I do have a list of 
you know, beauty labs and cannabis labs and, you know, flavor labs. And so uh, I have a lot of uh, good connections, you know, here that if someone needs something, I have a you know, connection to a guy on the East Coast that will do food labels. So, you know, when you, if you're doing supplements or food, you have to have your calories on the, on the bottle. And so, of course, you need someone to actually who's certified in that to do the food, that part of the food label. So, so I have a lot of these different people that I can send refer clients to if they need, hey, I need a label that has calories on it because I, I know I'm doing this. So, uh, so those are certainly all things I can source out, you know, that I'm happy to, to, to send to other people who are experts in. So, yeah, absolutely. Do you do any like performance testing so that somebody could make a claim about their product or is that also like a third party thing, or is that not something that is standard that people do? Yeah. In general, people don't, I mean, I'm not even seeing it from the big companies. I mean, maybe on their websites, but they'll say we've got hyaluronic or we're adding the you know two percent hyaluronic, but they're not making any real claims about you know spe- they're not being really specific about it. Uh, so for the major companies, I'm sure you know they're running one each batch to say if we say it's two percent hyaluronic, that's what it's coming out to be. But in general, uh, most people aren't really doing that. I mean, a lot of the cosmetics kind of have you know similar bases. Uh, you see that when we have new ingredients coming out, you know, there's, we're talking about polymers, we see new surfactants that come out, new polymers that come out. And of course, those are all, you know, generally chemically created. That's why they're new, right? We've kind of got all the natural stuff already done. So, uh, so you'll see new chemical ones. I don't use those as much, but there will be ones that are, oh, this stuff works. You don't have to use very much. And it makes this amazing cream with this amazing texture that maybe is a little tougher to get that texture with an all natural product. So people, if companies start using the newer stuff, then they tend to do more testing just to show it's in there and, uh, you know, because they just change their formulation. So usually if you're making a major change, your emulsifiers or your you know, something major in that base, then you might go ahead and rerun the test. But if you're just adding, you know, Hey, we're going to substitute in, you know, cinnamon and vanilla for lavender and chamomile in a very tiny, tiny amount, usually that's not worth bothering to test, especially if it's not an active ingredient. So right. it's really the active ingredients changing that are, that are the issue. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. And so going back to, you mentioned, um, polymers and surfactants, um, can you talk a little bit more about what they are and why it's important? Surfactants are interesting. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about hair care because I think you see them more in hair care than you do anywhere else. But essentially, surfactants have a what's considered a hydrophobic, which is the oil. Okay, it doesn't like water, hydro hate, no, hydro hating. And then you have hydrophilic, loves water, which is the water end, it's the water soluble end. And so soap, a true soap is considered to be, uh, so if you take like dish soap and you put it in the water and you can put, you know, and you try to float like a needle on it, it drops right in. But if you put the dish soap on and then you'll see the dish soap kind of spread out because it's a surfactant and then you can place a needle and it will float. Okay. It won't fall through. And the reason for that is because the surfactant takes the oil and it has an oily part and it has a water loving part. And we know that oil and water don't want to mix. So by, if you get in the shower and you're all oily and that water hits you and you don't, and you don't actually use soap, you will come out and you will still be oily. So what soap does, what surfactants, and soap is an example of a surfactant, is that the oily parts cling to the oil on your skin and the water loving part hangs off the end and hits the water that's coming out of the shower. And then when you, when it hits, it takes all of it away. And so it basically, it marries the two together. It's a way to marry oil and water. Emulsifiers work kind of the same way, but they're, they're less harsh. And we see that more with lotions and things like that. But when you need to get dirt, you know, out of something, you have to use a surfactant, you know, trying to get those oils to, to be removed. So you have, and you have different types of surfactants. You have uh, anionic and cationic and non-ionic and amphoteric. And if you really want to get the oil out of your hair, you really want an anionic surfactant. And essentially that means it's, it's a negative charge. And so it is getting in, your hair tends to be negatively charged. So it gets in there and it really gets uh, those oil particles and it attracts those oil particles to the shampoo. You might be getting the frizzies because you're using an anionic shampoo, which is fine. So that like two-in-one shampoo, 
two-in-one conditioner. Yeah, I don't believe in that because it's really more of a shampoo than a conditioner. So what makes a conditioner a conditioner is that um, you're actually adding cation surfactant. So that negatively charged crazy hair, now you're hitting it with a conditioner. And so it, it's positively charged. And essentially that's gonna neutralize that negative charge that's left on your hair from shampooing, which you needed because you had to strip the oils out, right? And then now it leaves your hair nice and soft and you have, you know, and it, and it basically balances the charges so that your hair isn't crazy. I've developed a lot of base recipes over time. So I have a base shampoo, I have a base conditioner um, and I haven't really released them as private label, but you know, I have my, my few that I put out there, but then I'll have someone come and say, Hey, do you have a conditioner? I'm like, well, I do. It's kind of, you know, it's a kind of a, a real basic one, but we could certainly build off that. Um, and, you know, and I make shampoo actually for a, a line out of Miami um, called Tresses Organics and, and she does all black girl hair stuff. And so I've been making her shampoo for quite a while and it has rosemary and neem in it. Uh, and the neem is really, really good for breakage and things like that. So I read up and make sure that I understand the science behind it. You know, am I going to need an anionic, uh, you know, surfactant uh, for, for this? Or am I going to need, is this more of a lotion, you know, beauty product for skin where I need something not quite as extreme. I need more of an emulsifier, just something that's going to disperse the oil and water, not really bind them together. So surfactant is kind of more like we're bound together. Whereas an emulsifier, which is going to be more for your skin because it's more delicate, that you can you want something a little more loosely bound um, that's going to be you know do no harm to your skin. So and then I read up you know if someone wants for example they want it to be for age uh, or for blemishes or those type types of things where I try to then add some minor ingredients um, I care even my carrier oils depending on you know if it's mostly water based. It is this for you know young people? Is this for someone older? You know that's going to help me determine my carrier oils. You know certain ones are better for aging skin. Certain ones are better for you know acne and young more young people issues, right? So that's kind of how I'm going to you know change my formulation uh, to make sure that it meets different people's needs. And uh, and I create a base recipe for a lot of things, and then I can certainly adjust them for my clients as I go. If somebody comes in and says, I really want to do something with castor oil. I've read all these amazing things about it, or I really want to do something with sesame seed oil. I know, can we do a massage oil, but have that be the base instead of what you're using now? And so I love to always play around and, and, and tweak these different custom formulations so that people get the exact ingredients they want to use because they have certain health benefits that they, they're looking for. Is there Anything else that's important in cosmetics development or beauty de beauty product development that we haven't covered so far? I think the biggest thing is just, you know, read your labels. Um, and I can't stress that enough. Uh, I've recently been talking to a few clients who are, are, are sending me stuff out of Paris and some beautiful, uh, incredible cosmetic companies. And I'm, I'm seeing sodium hydroxide. I'm seeing live right on the label. And I'm just shocked, you know, because, you know, sodium hydroxide is incredibly harsh and it's not the last ingredient on their list. It's somewhere in the middle. So that's also concerning because wow. if you, that's another thing. If you're knowing how to read a label, if you've never read an FDA label, everything has to start with the most, uh, the biggest ingredient and by percentage, and it goes all the way down to the very end of the last minor, minor ingredients, and it's all in decreasing order. So really pay attention to those first few, you know, because those are the ones you're getting the most of. And a lot of the ones at the end are fragrance. You know, we're going to put one little drop of, you know, geraniol, which is a terpene in here or lemon or limonene. And so they're very small amounts on those last ones, but it's concerning, you know, sodium hydroxide concerns me. I don't want to see that in any product. Uh, you know, even my shampoo, which I'm using potassium hydroxide to create a saponification reaction, I don't even have any left. And I know that because I'm checking my pH and the fact that it's coming in neutral tells me I've used up all of that potassium hydroxide and I know it's safe to use. And my labeling doesn't require me to say it. it's, it's fatty salt of you know, a potassium basically is what the FDA requires because I, if it's a soap and it's neutral, I've now proven that there's no leftover. So the fact that people are adding it to 
lotions when it, it isn't even doesn't even need to be there is concerning. So it's learning to read those labels um, and really. Are there other attention. ingredients that that you've seen that are there like a list of ingredients that besides the two that you mentioned that you would be like, stay away from these ones? Um, you know, obviously the obvious ones, but we all know about parabens now. We all know about, yep. you know, a lot of these, it's the kind of the one that you're seeing people, you know, starting to get away from and say, Hey, we're paraben free. We're this free. Um, I also don't use palm oil. I avoid palm oil because I don't want to get into an ethical issue of where do I source ethical palm oil? Because that's like right. asking, where do you source non-blood diamonds? Uh, you don't. Okay. So I've been to, I've been to West Africa. I've spent time. I know a diamond miner and I can tell you that there's a lot of things that, you know, we put stamps on and say they're safe and they're good. And uh, when they get to the U.S., but they're not, you know, they're coming from bad places and, and people aren't being treated humanely. So those are things that I look for as well is, is can I avoid getting into some kind of global debate about something by avoiding certain ingredients and just not going there? Sodium benzoate, we've used it for preservatives forever, but there is a concern. Uh, and really, it's not a big concern with sodium benzoate as much as it is for some of the, the sunscreen additives that have benzene in it. That's where we're really seeing it. But the concern is um, that if it has a benzene generated ring in there, we know benzene to be highly carcinogenic. The way they found out that benzene was actually carcinogenic was that people who worked in factories and especially with their hands used to wash their hands with it because it's a fantastic grease oh. remover. And oh, they discovered wow. that people who did this had huge tumors only on the skin of their hands. Oh, That's my how goodness. they found out that benzene was a no-no. I don't know if you've seen all the recalls on sunscreen just in the last year. Every one of them tested positive for a few parts per million of benzene because heat breaks it down, time breaks it down. Don't be leaving that stuff in the car because things can break down and you're not, you might not like what happens, but natural ingredients, the only thing my test stuff will do in extreme heat is you'll slowly see a little bit of a separation. And that's because you're not seeing chemicals. It doesn't smell weird. You're not seeing any of that. You're just going to slowly see that emulsion slowly fall apart and all emulsions will eventually fall apart. You know, if you leave a jar of cream and, you know, if we put it into a capsule and 50 years from now, we open it up. I don't care who made it. It's going to be separated. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. I, I have a few more questions because I know we got to wrap up here. What is different about doing beauty products for California markets? And what is different for EU markets and general US market? Well, I would say, you know, California, for the most part, it just follows the FDA regulations. Um, it is interesting. The people here are interesting. You know, I, I get calls. I get to, I got to quote a, a vegan wrapper on a vegan cosmetics line. Like, how how cool is that, right? So you got to love California for that. Uh, but but really, the rules of California are just follow the FDA rules and make sure that you know we know what you're doing too. Uh, and uh, but there's more rules with sales tax here than there probably are with cosmetics, honestly. Uh, but the EU, the, the challenge with the EU, you know, California has its own set of forbidden chemicals that we don't have in the rest of the U.S. But most of those are we think of them more as airborne, and uh, and so those are the ones prop you know prop 65. That's those are the ones you have to think about. So that was an example I gave where cannabis contains myrcene, the naturally occurring ingredient, also super great for cramps. Love it in formulations for cramps. However, the state of California, not the US, has decided that it might possibly be carcinogenic in large quantities. And granted, I'm not putting large quantities into a PMS roll-on, but because they have it on the Prop 65 list, I either have to you know, put Prop 65 warning on the actual packaging here or eliminate it as an ingredient. So I eliminated it as an ingredient. So that's really the only thing that I can think of for California. You've got to watch the packaging with Prop 65 and make sure all of those statements are correct. Now, um, for EU, you have a very different set of forbidden ingredients. And generally, that's a bigger list. Um, you know, without stepping on too many toes, I think the EU tends to be a little more progressive and that they're looking, they're seeing research and they're saying, maybe we need to ban this sooner than later. And I think the FDA tends to be on the more, on the later side um, for whatever reason, just the governing bodies. And so uh, the EU tends to be a little more, I think, progressive and, and, you know, 
making sure that that list is being followed. Uh, and certainly, you know, they have, you know, chemists that are, you know, they, they call them chemists generally over there, you know, as opposed to a formulator, but chemists who can make your product and manufacturers as well. And, uh, and I don't know all the, the ins and outs of the details, you know, as far as the regs for EU, but, uh, but a lot of them are pretty similar to the FDA. Um, and again, keeping, you know, it's just a different set of regulations. Canada as well um, is, you know, they have their own set of regulations through Health Canada. And, uh, and you just have to kind of follow that section that applies to you. But generally that applies to manufacturers. It doesn't, it doesn't apply to someone who's branding their product. You're, by you buying it from a manufacturer, it's the manufacturer who's responsible. And so that's kind of like in the US, it's cradle to grave. If they manufactured it, they are responsible for it until it's off the, you know, it's disposed of. And therefore, if you were to have a problem, your, that's why your manufacturer goes onto the packaging so that there's, you know, or they can contact you directly and you're the distributor of your product for that reason so that the manufacturer has insurance, product, you know, general insurance, product insurance, all those things to protect from any issues with formulation, you know, a bunch of people got a rash, that kind of stuff. So, um, so generally all the onus goes on whoever's physically manufacturing it and they have to follow a lot more regulations than the person who's just branding it and putting it out there as their own. Got it. That makes sense. If an entrepreneur has an idea for a new product, like what are the steps they should expect in working with formulator? And um, when an entrepreneur approaches you with an idea for a product, what do you need from them to get started? Oh, that's a great question. So, uh, so yeah, I've kind of honed my process over the years working with clients to make it as simple as possible, but really you want to start with a formulator. And the reason is because a lot of people will go straight to a supplier. They'll say, well, I want to make something that has ashwagandha in it. So I'm going to go find an ashwagandha supplier. And that's great. And you're going to need them eventually. But in the beginning, you don't really need them. You need to be able to get your prototype made. You need to be able to get your idea out of your head and physically made, right? In a very small form, samples of your idea. But a lot of times big manufacturers may start at 500, some of them started at 1,000 or 5,000 bottles. And so you've got to have, you know, anywhere between 10, 20, 50 grand to walk in and lay down. And most people don't have that, especially if they own a small business. So starting with a formulator and especially someone like me who has this amazing network of all those other people you're going to need. So you want a formulator that is connected to those other people and they know where to source your stuff and they know who to talk to for down the road when you're going to be doing large manufacturing. So, and just getting your idea from your brain into a physical bottle, a physical thing is so important because you learn so much and you hone what you want. You know, I've, I have a lot of clients that will start with, oh, I want this and this and this. And then once I make those samples for them, they're like, wow, I didn't think about that. Or I really like what you did over here. And I hadn't thought of that. And so those are things that, you know, a formulator can help you do is really hone your idea and give you something physical to try. And so I go through and the first, you know, I, I get as much information as I can from my client, which includes things like, um, you know, the size, the size, even the price point that helps me know, you know, how much room do I have here to put fancy stuff, you know, some new fancy thing that I want to try, or like, if we're going to use saffron, it's going to be a little more expensive than if we used, you know, basil, right? So, so those are things I want to know up front from, you know, I'm keeping that in product in mind as, as an engineer. So that that way they end with what they they initially had pictured, and uh, and we go through and, and I make samples of you know these are the ingredients they're interested in using. I research those ingredients. I check for safety. I check regulatory, and also you know what are their favorite products out there. A lot of people will come to me and say, I really want to kind of make something similar to this that I found in another country or this that I found on vacation, but I want this slight change to it. Can you do that? And I definitely can do that. So being able to bring examples, uh, ingredient lists, all, you know, I'm a data person. So the more information you can give me, the more I can really mimic what you want. And then we go through and do rounds of samples. So, you know, round one, I'm trying some different things. They're wildly different so that I can get some really good feedback from you. And then we go through and we do a second and maybe a third round um, on custom products. We usually do five rounds. It takes longer. And then you end with this amazing product. And I usually make about a hundred of prototypes for you. And this is a chance to try out packaging with you, right? So we're talking about how packaging 
um, how important it is that you know what kind of packaging you're going to be using so that you create the right viscosity. Is that the right word? Yes. Yay, yeah. well, awesome job. <laughs> exactly. Like if, if I make a really thick liquid and you want to put it through a cute little pump, it's not going to happen because it may not pump properly or spray properly, or now it's going to clog the sprayer. And those are all things people just wait till they get to the manufacturing stage. And then they're like, oh yeah, well, we'll put it in this. And it's like, but your formulation affects your packaging. So you kind of want to at least start that process while you're formulating. And then that's why I like to make those prototypes. And I call them prototypes because they're not necessarily meant to be sold. They're meant to be given to your influencers, given to your mom, given to, you know, the babysitter down the street. And you get feedback from your, you know, your best clients, get them involved. Um, a lot of times people get excited about being a guinea pig, like ask them, Hey, I'm, I'm working with a formulator and I'm going to get some samples. Would you like to try them? And give me some honest feedback so we can really make it amazing. Most people love to be a part of something like that and to get to, you know, this is what I love. This is what I didn't love. And that's one of the reasons I do the prototypes at the end. So that's like a scale up phase. So that before, you know, we, I send you to a big manufacturer, we've already gone through, we scaled it up, we fixed any issues, and we've gotten some feedback from your people who are going to buy it. And, and that gets people on board so quickly. And, and the ones who try it usually are the ones who come right back and buy the new version because they want to see, you know, how oh, you made it yeah. better. And if you listen to them and, and so those are ways you can really get your clients, you know, your, your people involved, your customers involved that, you know, that feedback loop, but that's really oh, what true science yeah. is, right? It's that right. hypothesis, you did experiment, oops, that didn't work. Barbie shrinky dinks, you know, back to, back to the lab again, right? <laughs> that's how you continuously improve. And I think if yeah. you, it's fun to, you know, work that way. Um, and I think you get that more with another small business formulator than if you're working with a huge company, right? You're one of many, you know, with me, you're going to get that one-on-one -on -one and I'm going to give you that feedback and I'm going to make those changes quickly. And so that way you get a little more of that personal, personalized attention to getting exactly what you had in your head produced in real life. And, and, you know, that's people aren't, you want to be happy at the end of it, you know, of the, of the whole right. Thing. And you want your customers to be happy and to be able to like, you know, get that feedback from customers or from family or whoever, whoever, whoever's trying the product. And even once you do start selling it, you get the reviews and you see like, Hey, here are some things that we can tweak. How cool is that? That you can yeah. go back to your formula, you can tweak it and then scale it up. And I think it's important because small businesses can pivot much faster and you can, you know, say, Hey, we listened to your feedback and we're going to, you know, we're making changes or we're going to, we're going to do bigger bottles. You guys are wanting bigger bottles. We've got it. We're That's the next thing we're doing. And then you're asking for something to go with this product. So you eat, and that's also a great way to collect those email addresses and get the, you know, some of your clients on a mailing list so that when you're ready to launch, you know, your finished product you've already got all their information and they're seeing those, those posts come in and those emails come through. Absolutely. Okay. Now this is the final question. <laughs> We're going to wrap up now. We, I think forever. We, went, we went a little bit longer than uh, we anticipated, but I think this has been all like super valuable information. So I'm excited to share it with everybody. Um, so my last question is like, what is your favorite product? The products that I love, I love my age serum. Um, it's a, you know, my daily serum. I love it. It's just a nice finish. It's got that little bit of rose. I think I'm, I'm a rose addict, um, but and it's good for, you know, for aging and just, just that calming feeling. It really calms my skin. Uh, and then also I'm, I'm finding for stress. Uh, I, I have a PMS blend that I've used for years, roll-ons and, and you know, spray. And I love that. It's like when I'm ready to choke someone, you know, you're just kind of moody and you're just, you know, you're yeah. not, you know, you're just not right. And so boy, a little spray of that. And now I'm a much nicer human. And so, wow, so that's those amazing. Are of, those are some of my favorites that I've developed that have just kind of helped like boost my mood. Uh, but as far as other products, you know, I don't make my own sunscreen because as we mentioned, it's regulated as a drug. And so it's a whole thing, right? Uh, but my favorite is Kula. It's a BB cream and it's actually a San Diego company. I found out about them not long after I was here and I, I could probably guess I know their manufacturer, uh, <laughs> but they're, you know, I had always been, a, because I have sensitive skin, you know, I was really worried about the water base just seems to just soak into my skin and give me acne with any kind of sunscreen. And I switched over to using that, that oil-based BB cream and I love it. And so I use their 30 SPF uh, on the daily and it's has a little bit of a tint 
So I don't wear base anymore. I don't oh, wear makeup I anymore. That. I put that I on and that. it's lip and then my lip, my lip tint, I put that on and then, you know, maybe eyeliner and that's it. That's all I do. <laughs> that's, that's all the effort I'm putting in that day, but it's fantastic. And it does not clog my pores. And the fact that I'm supporting another San Diego company and they're just a fun, um, a really fun company and, you know, out here. So I, I recommend Kula, C-O-O-L-A, if you haven't checked them out. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Christine. It has been wonderful hearing all of this amazing information. Um, if people want to contact you, um, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, so they're welcome to call me, uh, 858-900-6205, or they can certainly email me, uh, Queen B is kind of my generic email, but Queen B at KemiQueenB.com or check out our website, KemiQueenB, C H E M E, QueenB.com. So, uh, but yeah, I would, I do free 30 minute consultations with all my clients on Calendly. So feel free to book a 30 minute session and we'll chat. And, and then once, you know, you're ready to move forward, we can do an NDA and then we can chat in more detail and, and all that kind of stuff and, and see how I can formulate for you. I'm excited. And I'm excited to work with you as well, Lauren, and on yeah. your packaging, you know, for me to make what's in the bottle and for you to make what's yes. outside the bottle pretty and, you know, and, and to be able to work together is exciting. Well, thank you so much. That wraps up our, our episode, um, Entrepreneur Minds Speak. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.